Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Webinar Express, Crisis Leadership, How to Lead Effectively in the Toughest of Circumstances. Uh, this webinar is organized by CIM Southwest. If you are a university student attending today's webinar, you may want to sign up for the CIM Marketing Club newsletter. It'll keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is take a photograph of the QR code you see on screen at the moment, and that will take you straight to the sign-up page on the CIM website. Okay, so now I'd like to hand over to Tim Johnson from Deloitte's Crisis and Resilience Practice, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Tim. Lovely. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to talk to you uh, this afternoon, and I, I hope um, as many of you as possible are enjoying this uh, from the comfort of your garden or somewhere else where the, where the sun is, is shining. Um, so look, a very brief introduction um, to, uh, to, to me. Um, my name is Tim Johnson, um, and um, I started my career uh, about uh, 20, 25 years ago, uh, working for a big US-owned uh, public relations uh, uh, business. Um, and from there, um, I moved after several years to a, uh, to a small boutique called Register Larkin, really where I wanted to focus in on, on my love um, of, of crisis and, and, and issues management, help the organizations, both public and private, uh, when they were facing pressure, really, when they were facing problems, when they were, um, to, to use the word, um, crisis. And that was a business I thought I'd be in for about uh, for about 12 months. About 12 years later, I was still I was still there. And we, we sold that business uh, into into Deloitte um, in December um, uh, 2016. Um, and that's where I am now. And I lead uh, what we call our crisis uh, reputation um, and resilience um, uh, practice uh, there. Um, and effectively within that, within that practice, what we do is, is three things. We, we help clients um, with all sorts of, of communications um, and reputation management uh, uh, challenges, whether that's big programs um, or whether they are facing a situation that requires particularly sensitive or, or, or acute management. We help clients uh, with crisis um, and resilience challenges. So we help clients to, to, to implement um, the ways of running their organization should they find themselves uh, facing an unexpected um, shock. Um, and we also help clients as well um, to do that when they when they face real shocks as well. So we go into into client organisations to help them manage the response um, to to crises. Um, and, and finally, we get involved um, with with clients' enterprise risk management um, initiatives, which really on those first two that I'm going to focus over the course of the of, of the next over the course of the next half an hour. Now, during my career, it's been my absolute privilege to work with, with public and private sector um, organisations on, on incidents ranging from major cyber attacks, industrial accidents, terrorist incidents, public health emergencies, and um, product recalls, uh, recalls through to sensitive mock exits, restructuring programmes, um, and allegations um, of, of misconduct. And it's some of the thinking and experience that I've gained in doing that over the course of the last 20 to 25 years that I'd like to, to, to share with you. What I can't do, unfortunately, is talk you through lots of different um, exciting and, 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 and swashbuckling stories. What happens in the crisis management room needs, of course, to stay um, in the crisis management room. But what I'd like to do really is take you through a few uh, frameworks, ways of thinking about things. But I hope to start to un unpick this concept of, of, of crisis. Crisis is a word that is used a little bit like um, strategy, like leadership, like culture. But it's often used without discipline and without forethought to what it is that we're actually talking about. Um, and, and a lot of that is because business is a, is a social, social science, organizations in general are, are, are social sciences. And so what I like to do during these presentations is give a few ways of thinking about things that might help you as marketeers when you're helping your organization. I'm really, really going to show you three or four slides over the course of the next 25 minutes. But I hope they, they bring to life some of the ways in which I try and think about things and hopefully they will be of use um, to you. I uh, would like you to ask yourselves um, when the last time was that you uttered the immortal words, what they need to do is. And these are words that we all use whenever we are reading a newspaper article, we're watching the news on television, we're scrolling through our, our Twitter feed. And we find ourselves um, reading about an organization for possibly for all of the wrong reasons, finds itself at the source of a, of a crisis. It finds itself under the spotlight for potentially all of the wrong uh, reasons. And our immediate thought is to say what they need to do is, after which we list a very elegant and very simple set of solutions that in, in our mind would relieve them um, of the situation that they face themselves in at the current time. Now, that is uh, at times great fun. And in the days when we were all able to go to, uh, to dinner parties and interact with each other in, in a rather more easy way than we are at the moment, 
it promotes great dinner table conversations. But from my perspective, whenever we're looking at crisis management, we're looking at a series of trade-offs. And there are two principles that I go into every single crisis management um, room with. And the first principle is this, that if there were a simple solution to the crisis, then those leaders in charge of the response, they usually would have found it. And that's based on, on, on two facts. Number one, leaders of large complex organizations, they're not daft. They wouldn't be in the position that they were in were they not able to, to grapple with complex problems. And number two, um, they don't want bad things to happen. Organization leaders do not want to be in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. And generally speaking, they do not want to find their organization um, in conflict with stakeholders that expect something of them. Nevertheless, they are in the situation in which they are in. But it's a profoundly interesting point because next time a, a crisis emerges onto our TV screens or onto the front page of the newspapers, ask yourself how quickly you ask yourself the question what they need to do is, and then please bear in mind what it is I'm about to talk about and ask yourself really uh, whether we might want to cut them some slack, but we might want to understand some of the very, very complex issues that those leaders um, are going through. What I've done here is give um, a pretty academic definition um, of, of a for crisis um, situation, um, what we're actually talking about um, when we're talking about a crisis. And the reason that I like this quote is that like every good piece of prose, every word carries semantic weight. Every part of it gives us partially an answer to the, the conundrum that crisis provide us with. And I want to just step through it now in, 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 in very swiftly. So what is a crisis? A crisis is an organizational crisis is a low probability, high impact event that threatens the viability of the organization. It's characterized by ambiguity, cause effect, and means of resolution, as well as by belief that decisions must be made swiftly. Well, let's try and dissect that a little bit and then trying to unpick some of the challenges that leaders face when they find themselves leading during the toughest of circumstances. The first is that a crisis is a low probability, high impact event. Well, in the management of any situation, most leaders like to try to turn to experience. They like to try to look back on a moment in which they have faced something similar and draw upon that experience in order to find their way through the situation. Well, this is a low probability event. This is a situation unlike any that those that they've probably faced before. So therefore, their, ex their ability to draw on that experience becomes much less um, solid than it would have been on a day-to-day -day basis. Not only that, the stakes are very, very high, that the, the viability of the organization itself is under threat, or at least there is a perception that the viability of the organization um, is under threat. And moreover, it gets worse because the situation is characterized by ambiguity of cause effect and by means of resolution. We don't know what caused it. And by crikey, we certainly don't know what's going to resolve the situation. And it gets even worse than that. Not only is there ambiguity of cause, effect, and resolution, but there's also a belief that decisions must be made swiftly. The viability of the organization is at stake. I don't know what's happened. I don't know how to fix it, but I need to come to a decision very, very quickly. And as we all know, organizations don't move quickly, particularly not large, complex organizations. In fact, most large, complex organizations are deliberately designed to slow them down. So this quote here, a little bit drier though it may be, starts to bring to life what a crisis actually is and some of the problems that leaders face um, in trying to tackle them. But of course, a crisis is not a crisis. A crisis is not a thing in its own right. A crisis has a cause. Okay, And, and when, where, whenever I'm thinking about crisis, I like to try, like any good consultant, to put crises into one of four individual um, boxes for the simple reason that they start to unpick some of the dynamics, some of the specific challenges that leaders face when they are facing different types um, of, of, of crisis. Now, this is the matrix that I typically like to use when I'm thinking about different types um, of, of crisis. I'm going to work to your left and over to, um, to, 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 to your right. Um, the first is really what we would refer to as, as incident-led um, led crises. Um, and those on the right-hand side are what we call issues-led crises. So incident-led crises tend to fit into one of um, two buckets. They're either operational, um, or they are security-led. So operational usually means um, a failure um, in safety, whereas security can, can typically relate either to, to something cyber-related or, or often events of, of, of national environmental-led um, uh, um, situations that organizations um, are facing. On the right-hand side, um, there are what we refer to as issues-led crises, and generally speaking, they fall again also into, into two brackets. There are those crises that we return to refer to um, as performance-led crises. Usually that's in relation to leadership or management 
or a failure of governance um, in, in some way, shape or form. And the other area is usually what we refer to as policy uh, related crises. And, and policy related crises probably the most intractable of all types of crises because usually what it means, and I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later, is the organization's behavior has departed company with what it is that our stakeholders expect us um, to do. There's a differential there between performance um, and, and expectation. And there's a need therefore to close that gap. There's a possibility also of uh, typically trying to define those into um, situations that have, have occurred from within inside the organization and, and those situations or crisis situations that occur outside the organization to which we need um, to, to, to respond. The big difference between the left hand side and the right hand side though um, is time. Um, and time can be a very, very false friend um, in most crisis situations. On the left hand side, there is clearly a deficit of, of time. There is no doubt that an intervention needs to be made. There is no doubt that leadership needs to do something. Lives or the environment may be at stake and therefore action is required. And so there's a sense that we have to move often without thinking and to just act. On the right hand side, um, time there is a false friend because there's a sense that we have plenty of time to fix whatever it is that may ultimately go on to be the source of that crisis. But we don't take that time. We don't make the change that's required. And change is an important word because avoiding issues and crisis nearly always requires change. Change is exhausting, change is expensive, and change usually brings conflict. So we tend to avoid that. And that's why issues tend to bubble along until they reach a point at which they themselves become a crisis in their, in their own right. So those are typically the four areas where crises tend to emerge from, including the dynamics in managing both of those different sets of crises um, are very, very, very different indeed. Um, one of the, um, uh, the lines that's not drawn across uh, this matrix that, of course, is a perennial challenge in any crisis is the concept of, 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 of a villain um, and those to whom harm has been done. Um, and we live in a world of, of free media and free speech. Of course, we do. And therefore, generally speaking, it is our instinct as human beings to find a villain of the piece. And, and usually um, organisations need to understand what their role is um, in the crisis. And that can also bring profound problems, which I'd like to touch on um, a little bit um, in, in, in the next slide. But I hope that's a helpful way for you to think about where crises come from, what their sources are, and some of the differentials and the different characteristics of the way in which they tend to emerge um, for organizations. The question then becomes, well, what do we um, as leaders do about it? Or we could even back up further than that and, and say, cri are crises um, inevitable? Can they be um, avoided? And of course, the chances of a crisis happening can be uh, reduced, steps can be taken, and we spend a huge amount of our time with our clients looking at their organizational resilience in, in broader terms in, in order that they're able to mitigate the potential impact of the crisis or even remove it altogether. But I, I typically stand, tend to stand behind the fact that accidents will happen. There are two kinds of theories in the world. There is the high reliability organizational theory, which says that we can reduce the chances of crisis having to almost zero. And then there's a normal accident theory, which says that organizations these days are so complexly interactive that at some point something will break and having been in enough crisis management rooms over the years um, stood by the side of the leader where he or she says to me I never thought this could have happened um, I'm firmly in the camp that says that a crisis can and will at some point happen for most organizations so what do leaders do then need to do um, to, to respond um, to, to all of that? Well, clearly there's a huge amount of preparedness work um, that, that can be done, and many of you will be familiar from that within your own organisations. There are typical structures that are put in place which look at the tactical, operational and strategic response teams created um, at, at, at three levels, usually to respond to crises of different escalations um, in, in, in magnitude. But ultimately, um, it is people who manage crises and not processes. Those processes are vital to enable people to be set up for success. But it is the leader at the center of all of that whose view we're going to try and look through um, over the course of the, the remaining sort of 14, 15 minutes that we have for this presentation. And I'd like to pose the question, first of all, what is it that leaders have to do to respond to crises um, effectively. And I'm not going to say well, good or bad, I'm going to say effectively or ineffectively, because generally speaking in a crisis, we're dealing in the management of trade-offs. There is no good solution for if there were, well, there wouldn't be a crisis in the first place. So let me outline now what it is that I think the four things are um, that crisis leaders need to do um, effectively. And when you're thinking about these things, I want to imagine yourself that you're in a room 
and you are surrounded by 10, 12, uh, 15 people, uh, and all of their eyes are on you for a sense of direction and for decisions and to help make those trade-offs which are um, inevitable. And there are four things when you find yourself in that position which sound terribly easy but are phenomenally hard um, to execute. So from my perspective, there are four things that leaders of each of those individual teams, so those teams that you are now imagining that you are running, uh, need to do. And, and, I, and I list them in, in order, in chronological order of, of, of importance, actually. So the first is a need to establish situational awareness. What on earth has happened? What are the impacts that are being felt um, on our organization? Now, leaders in most crisis situations, in my experience, they don't tend to, 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 to panic. Um, but there, are ten, there do tend to be two uh, responses to most crises um, that, I, that I have seen um, in leaders. The first is a desire to, to immediately issue um, an action. We must do this, we must do that, we must do this, we must do that. And or they find themselves unable to make a decision, unable to forge um, a path forward. And there's a biological reason for that. Um, when, when our brains start to feel stress, we, we, we relegate the prefrontal cortex, the place in which we start to make um, rational decisions. That all gets removed um, and, and fundamentally we go into fight or flight. That can then lead to a premature instruction of a series of set of actions which actually fix the wrong problem rather than the right problem. This need to create situational awareness therefore becomes absolutely paramount. And any leader in any organization facing a crisis should say to themselves, this situation is not going to manage me, I am going to lead through it. And therefore a series of, of systems and structures need to be set up in place in order that that leader can listen to their organization because the organization and the outside world will be speaking to them and that will be a dynamic process. It will be happening on an hour by hour, day by day process, and it will be conflictual. And finding our way through that situation um, will be absolutely uh, vital. It sounds terribly simple, but the amount of crisis management team meetings I have sat in on, where there is a difference of opinions between the leader and his or her followers around the table is innumerable. That is why we write things down on a piece of paper. And in fact, sometimes what I do with clients is I, I read out a scenario, I get them each to write down what it is that I've said, uh, a group of 10 to 12 people, and then I get all the pieces of the paper back, and what you'll find is a profoundly different series of interpretations of what I've said. Establishing situational awareness cannot be more important. The second point is to define purpose. What are we here to do? And that, that exists at both an organizational level, but also exists at a team level as well. Crisis situations um, provoke all kinds of different reactions, some of them which are well-meaning, but often there can be a duplication or a miss of different actions that are, that are required. So defining what individual teams are there to do, and most importantly, what they are not there to do, becomes incredibly important. On a day-to-day -day basis, um, differences of opinion emerge within leadership and management the whole time, and we step over those um, differences on a day-to-day -day basis. But a crisis won't allow us to do that. It forces a limelight on certain relationships where we are required to say to each other, you are doing this and I am doing that. Are we all absolutely agreed? But, but there is a wider organizational angle on that as well, which, which, is, which is very, very interesting, particularly in the context of COVID-19. In most, crisis, um, most, most crises, there is a requirement for a whole range of different organizations to get involved um, in, in the response. And again, that will... Uh, that can bring uh, the possibility of duplication um, and, 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 and frankly, organizations treading on each, other's, um, on each other's toes. We have to know what it is that we are there to do. And one of the most interesting observations I had during COVID-19 was, was finding, for example, um, several retailers starting to make protective um, clothing and finding perfume manufacturers over in, in France starting to make um, antibacterial hand gel. So um, that, that was a fantastic uh, moment of creativity, which I'll return to in a minute. But, but it was all defined by purpose and the fact that what is it that we can do? What is it rather than we have to do? I asked you the question, what would happen if several retailers started to make antibacterial hand gel? Defining the purpose becomes key. Setting objectives also becomes very, very important. What is it that we are trying to achieve in our response to this crisis? Again, it sounds terribly simple, but the key Achilles heel is for most organizations, those that particularly haven't faced a crisis before, is they start to lose sight of what is in their control and what is out of their control. We cannot uncrash a plane. We have to deal with the situation as it stands at the moment and mitigate the impact on those who have been affected. 
and having a clear set of objectives written on a board or written on a virtual noteboard, whatever it might be, becomes absolutely vital because that is our North Star. And for your leader, that becomes an absolutely vital North Star because there will come a moment during that situation when he or she is required to make a decision upon which there is no clear answer. And writing down what your objectives are will give them that golden opportunity to be able to say, I don't know what the answer is right now, but number one, based on the information that I've received, which is my situational awareness. Number two, knowing what it is that we are here to do. And number three, knowing what it is that we are trying to achieve. The only direction I can give is as follows. Setting objectives, slowing the pace, bringing it right back down to what it is that we feel we can achieve in response to a crisis becomes absolutely vital. And then the final point is, uh, it sounds even more simple, and that's around setting actions. Um, there are a couple of points I would make around around this. First of all, particularly when we are dealing with a crisis whereby there is a geographically located set of people who are impacted, there is absolutely no doubt um, that the crisis is best managed close to where um, the impacted um, communities, people or environment actually are. Most organisations are not structured like that now. We work on global business lines. We are globalised um, uh, in, 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 in the structures that we that, that we sit in. So finding out who is going to do what, when, why and how becomes actually not quite as straightforward um, as, it, as, it, as it should be. Moreover, um, for many organisations, um, the concept of a meeting is something that is not as disciplined as it needs to be during a crisis. How many of us have been to a meeting about a meeting because we have a meeting to go to tomorrow? We better just have a meeting because we can't really remember what the actions were that we agreed from the, from the previous meeting. That cannot happen in a crisis. Who is doing what, by when, and with what resources? Absolute discipline um, is, is required. And simple as it may sound, those are the four things that I command any leader um, needs to do during um, a crisis. Now, the point that you will all, I hope, make to that is, well, why is that different from what a leader does um, on a day-to-day -day basis? And the answer is, it isn't. But being a leader on a day-to-day -day basis is not simple. Were it simple, then we would all be leaders. What I'm asking leaders to do during the crisis usually is to do what they will do on a day-to-day -day basis, just to do it against immeasurably more difficult circumstances and with the scrutiny of the external world. And many people saying what they need to do is. Let's just quickly go over to the next slide because it's not just a case of, of what it is that leaders need to do, it's how they should do it um, as well. And I spend a lot of my time um, coaching leaders um, either during live crisis situations or in anticipation of them about the sort of behaviours that they need to demonstrate um, as well. And generally speaking, when organisations will call me and they will say, can you teach our leaders to be more command and control um, in the way in which they operate during crisis? To which my response is, well, I can, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And I, and I prefer to call it directive collaboration for the simple reason that there is a danger um, of, of, a, of a more authoritarian approach to leadership um, during a crisis, which is absolutely the opposite to the one that we need um, to take. The leader that sits at the head of a table, if you imagine yourself still there and dishes out orders without listening to others is the leader that is destined to fail. The person at the end of the table who may be having a psychologically more uh, a difficult response to, to, to the crisis, but may well have an answer to give or an option to give, needs to be listened to and needs to be heard. So that meeting discipline and working around the room becomes vital, but so too, other behaviours that the leaders need to demonstrate. And I've listed here um, 10 different behaviours that for me, all combined, and no leader ever does all of these, start to get to the heart of what, um, how an effective crisis leader behaves. Number one, they're open-minded to all possible solutions. If there's ambiguity of cause, effect and resolution, then there has to be a whole raft of options that they can call upon um, in order to fix um, the situation. So they need to go into that situation in, in a way that's open-minded. Number two, they need to be creative. There is a danger in a crisis situation that we start to see the world in black and white. And there's a simple reason for that. And that is because usually the media commentaria asks us to see the world in those simplistic terms of black and white. But the world is not black and white. An answer between uh, two, two, two extremes generally is the answer that we need to go for. Number three, a needs, leader needs to be empowering. And there's absolutely no way that a crisis is the moment for a leader to decide that they want to be involved in every single action. Um, that is undertaken by every single member of the team. There has to be an element of trust. There has to be an element of empowerment that goes on there. Number four, they need to be communicative. They need to be communicative, yes, to the outside world, but also to the internal world as well. And the internal world is a world that is often forgotten during the crisis. An explanation of what is happening and why it is happening becomes absolutely vital. Now is not the moment to go and disappear into an office and try to figure out the problem on their own. 
Number five is about being externally focused. I'm going to leave that for now because I'm going to come back to it for a moment. But understanding what it is, how the world perceives the way in which you are responding, of course, becomes absolutely vital. There's an element of bravery that's always involved um, in, in a crisis. Um, the easiest position in the, in, in the room is to be uh, the number two to the leader. The answer then is always obvious. Put yourself in that seat and ask yourself to take a decision which is against protocol, which is against any sort of standard operating procedure that you've worked to in the past, which is against anything the organization has ever done in the past. And then we start to understand the levels of bravery sometimes um, that, that leaders take across both the public and the private sector leaving themselves accountable and responsible for that decision. Leaders need to be controlled. There's a difference between why and why. There's a difference between now and now. We need to understand what our emotional responses are to the information that we receive. Followers will always look to the most microscopic responses from a leader um, when they are given them bad news. Does his or her eyes move? What's their facial expression? We need to make sure that we are controlling our own behaviours around those um, you need to see us um, being in control or not when the moment comes for it. But we need to decide how to behave, not to have ourselves behave in an uncontrolled fashion. We have to be uh, empathetic. We have to understand that people's personal lives, when they're operating on those crisis teams, um, they do not leave their personal lives at home by no means. And all of the challenges they face on a day to day basis do not disappear. They remain with them and therefore being empathetic to those members of that team. Um, is an even greater requirement, frankly, than it is on a day-to-day -day basis. There's something that I call the, the, the walking around the block moment. Um, and nearly always when a, a crisis leader has been brave and made a decision, um, there is something that's called post-decision dissonance. Um, and that is the moment of, have I really made the right call here? Because there wasn't perfect information, because there's ambiguity of cause, effect and resolution. So a crisis leader needs to be constantly reflective there doesn't need to be constant U-turns on decision made, but there does need to be a constant self-appraisal and self-criticism of could we have done that better? And then finally, clearly, a crisis leader needs to be resilient. But for many crisis leaders with whom I work, they are simply not used to the levels of external scrutiny, um, the coulda, woulda, shoulda, that is constantly um, presented to them um, in, the, in the media, um, that perhaps politicians are. Um, and so therefore finding ways of being resilient um, becomes absolutely important, whether that's sports games, whether it's families, whether it's having an independent third party to talk things through with. But clearly that definition of personal resilience therefore becomes very personal, but it has to be something that, that, that the leaders find um, for themselves. I started my life um, as a communications profession and, and still very much am a communications and corporate affairs uh, professional. Um, and then communications um, it is often a key part of, of what I'm engaged in in helping a client to think about as they go through um, as they go through a crisis, usually in a chief of staff role or as an external third party advisor. The overarching point I, I would like to make here is that, that words are incredibly important and positioning is extremely important, particularly when sensitive matters have to be conveyed to communities or individuals um, who are suffering great pain. But but we cannot communicate our way out of a crisis. We have to act our way out of a crisis. It's as simple um, as that. Re reputational damage occurs quite simply um, in social media um, and um, in traditional media when the difference between what a stakeholder expects us to do and what we achieve grows. We expect a plane to cross the Atlantic without crashing. We expect our client-based services to deliver uh, without uh, falling over. We expect very many things. And when, when that performance falls away, then a gap starts to, to emerge. And closing that gap does require communications. Of course it does, but it also requires the organization um, to, um, to think about what it is doing and how it is doing it, um, and to close that gap just as quickly as it possibly um, can do. Um, there are clearly ways of, of, of communicating during, during a crisis. There is absolutely a need to demonstrate care and concern for those um, who affected. There is absolutely a need to demonstrate control. We, we have mobilized everything we can to, to put the situation um, right. Um, and there is clearly a need to demonstrate a, a broader commitment to ensure that it won't happen again. But fundamentally, I like to bring the role of communications um, during a crisis um, down, down to, 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 three, to three key points. The first is helping to set stakeholder expectations. Um, Sometimes, particularly on that policy crisis that we talked about earlier, there is an expectation of organizations far beyond those at which they can actually achieve. Is that good? Is that bad? It's often a combination of the two. 
um, it's the it's the day to day tussle that, that that brings organisations and and particularly business organisations into line with the with the expectations that, that communities have um, of them. But helping to set expectations is an absolutely critical role um, of of any any crisis leader, particularly in those those, those early early stages. The second is a role um, that we really must never shy away from, um, and that is to represent stakeholder attitudes and expectations to align organisational performance when something has gone wrong. We as communicators need to be able to present those views back to the leadership and all of those trade-offs can be made and all of the problem can be rectified just as quickly as we can. That doesn't involve putting pen to paper, that involves listening, and it involves making a judgment. And it involves being fearless, actually, in bringing to the leader a series of, of problems, potentially, or challenges that he or she um, has to face. That is about the broader concept of reputation management rather than just communicating during um, a crisis. But then the final point, clearly, um, is, is actually um, engaging, um, empathising and explaining um, to stakeholders what it is that we are doing about the situation, how we feel about the situation, and what it is that we are doing in what kind of time frame um, in order to alleviate um, those, those concerns. Um, and there is, um, because we are all human, always a tendency to, uh, to want to say a situation is going to be fixed faster than perhaps um, it can be. So having an element of restraint in there becomes absolutely vital um, as well. Again, a judgment call, um, but one that every crisis um, requires. And just picking onto the uh, onto the final slide, um, I, I guess just to sort of regroup as we as we hit sort of 34 minutes past the hour, um, is to say that I hope some of the concepts there that I've given you are, are useful. They are not the answer, um, but but I'm hoping that when you are faced with a crisis situation, you can start to deconstruct it a little bit using some of the concepts um, that I put forward there um, to you, um, which I've uh, honed over many years of sitting next to and holding the slightly sweaty hand um, of a crisis leader. Um, as they seek to navigate their way through um, organisational um, crises from wherever they may have come from. And with that, I will pause, I think, because I'm right up at time, um, and hand it over to, um, to any questions. Okay, thanks, Tim. That's, that's really great. Thanks for a really um, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Okay, so we're now going to have a short Q&A session. There's still time to submit questions if you want to, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So, Tim, the first question is, uh, does a, a crisis management team take the lead in reviewing a company's operations and procedures to seek out potential crisis in advance, so mitigating the opportunity of failure? Yeah, is the, is the, is the, is the short answer. I, I mean, um, for, for most um, organisations, there, there will absolutely be a need to, to rehearse the crisis uh, management team at least once a year usually in, in, in full turnout. Um, for many organisations, they do it twice a year as well in order to ensure that the those people who are taking a role of, of deputy on the board of crisis management team also have an opportunity um, to, um, to, to, to rehearse their roles um, in a crisis as well. Crisis management teams need to learn how they're going to operate in the periods of, 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 great, of great stress and great, um, uh, great, great, great scrutiny. The only thing I, I would say um, is that um, there, there tends to be, um, in my experience, um, a desire to sort of fight the last war, to thinking about uh, different kinds of, of organisational crises that, that might emerge um, on the horizon um, as well. So the short answer is yes, just make sure we're always forward focused rather than just necessarily being backward focused or looking at other organisations. Okay, thanks, Tim. There's um, a related question here. In your experience, are crisis management core teams more effective when they are smaller in number, more focused, or larger groups with greater breadth of views? <laughs> so what a great question. So in, in my experience, it's a little bit like sort of the centralization and decentralization debate. What, what typically happens is that crisis management teams start off very, very small, um, and then they tend to build out over a period of years before a recommendation is made to trim it right back down um, to the um, to the to the core again. Um, but there was a, a trend um, a few years ago to be very very um, reductionist about the way in which you view a crisis management team and, and to review the core team down to three roles, which was a decider, so the leader, the person that has to make a decision, um, and uh, a lawyer, because there is nearly always a requirement for a lawyer in, in, in a crisis situation. And, and thirdly, also a, a communicator um, as, as well. And then everything else was kind of built around that. So, I, I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a danger of generalizing here. I, I am more of an advocate of a, of a smaller crisis management team. 
but but for me that probably is a little bit too small and there is a requirement for a, for a greater breadth of for a greater breadth of, of of views to be brought um to the table again it all depends on the individual organization but i'd be a few helpful remarks yeah. okay thanks tim um i think this question relates to one of the earlier parts of the presentation so is how our policy issues external or is it referencing external policies i.e from the government um yeah i think sort of just interpreting that that that, that question clearly um organizations um have a role to play in in being involved in the in, in the policy um debate that there is a need for them to have their voice heard in order that that their their, their needs and interests are, are heard everybody's uh, a policy view to, 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 to the left will clearly be different to the policy view to the right and therefore there is a there is a trade-off but, but generally speaking um, a lot large organizations have a requirement to make sure that they are constantly listening and wherever they can getting ahead of uh, that, that that policy debate and of course so you know succumbing where they where they need to in uh, also to, to, to changes to the direction that needs to be that need to be taken um, the, the biggest danger is a is a head in hands or a head in the sand um, approach which uh, this is not relevant to me I mean, it isn't going to happen it just can't happen and that is entirely the the, the, the wrong approach we absolutely have to be um, agile to to what the future might might bring and we've just um, completed a report uh, with the national preparedness commission and um, and cranfield university who are the leaders in, in organizational resilience thinking and point number one of a seven part process is to free your mind to think about what, what could happen to your organization so um, as i say those policy uh, the crises that originate in a policy tend to involve change and it's an uncomfortable period of of moving an organization to a new way of thinking um, but that doesn't mean that they can be ignored Okay, thanks. Um, I guess, Tim, it's inevitable that we've had questions around COVID, so I'm going to sort of read out three together. Um, so with the current COVID crisis, its scale and complexity, is there anything unique to a global pandemic that should be considered in addition to the points you've talked through? So that's the first question. What changes do you think organisations should make to their crisis management strategy in light of COVID is the second question. And the third question, somebody's asked what organisations have done well, uh, have responded the best to COVID, but whether you, I don't know if you can mention organisations, but I'm just wondering if there are any industry sectors that you think have done well um, at this crisis, or in, in responding to this crisis. What is unique about this is, is sort of fascinating, isn't it? Because I mean, there, there are, I think there are there are two key points about, about, about the pandemic and everybody on this call will have a different view of this. It's not the right answer, it's just an answer. Two of the most unique things about um, the, the, the pandemic were well, number one that it affected everybody. There just literally wasn't anybody in the world who who wasn't affected um, by by this particular situation. And number two, um, it's it was hard certainly in the early days to to, to pinpoint um, someone to blame. Uh, that our desire as human beings to find a villain um, is is inbuilt within us, um, and that was very very hard to do in this early stages of this of this pandemic. And so. What I very much enjoyed seeing when I raised a couple of the, the generic examples earlier um, is um, is organisations being all in it together to, to look to the wider good, to, to the broader health of, of nations um, and, and the international community um, as as well, while also ensuring that their own organisations were, um, were 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 bedded down and able to do with just such extraordinary um, speed. I, I, re I remember saying, you know, to 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 a client, I was supposed to bring some media training. There's no way I can run media training online in a remote format. I need to be in the room. Well, of, uh, of course, I mean, a pandemic is that I don't need to be. And, and it's moved us all at such a great pace. And, and that is, of course, um, you know, what, what a crisis can, can bring. And, and it's now become a bit of a trite phase. But before the pandemic, we always used to say, well, you know, a crisis can bring a new normal. And I've yet to say the word unprecedented, and I certainly don't intend to. You know, we used to say that crises... Yeah, leaders of leaders of organizations during crises have two options at the extremes number one um, they can repair the, the future that the, the followers once thought they might have and the crisis has dislocated them from that future or they can present a new future um, and, and the answer often lay somewhere in the middle and again the answer will lie somewhere in the middle I'm thinking here in terms of the ways of working remote working flexible working etc but those changes that we have brought have been completely fascinating from a scientific from a sociological from a, from a commercial um, perspective um, as, um, as 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 well. What have organisations done done well? Well, just that point. I mean, we've all moved online, and what was unthinkable 18 months ago um, has um, become 
daily. It's what we it's what we now what we now do. I, I do think though that for most organisations, certainly that I've been involved with over the course of the last twelve to eighteen months, the role of the HR function and human capital, as, as some would like to call it, um, has has been extraordinarily well done, and and it has called into question their role on the crisis management team. Um, which isn't forgotten almost, but can can sometimes be overlooked. It relates to that earlier point I made around internal communications. But that is just one example of the creativity that I talked about earlier um, that I think has been absolutely astonishing over the course of the last 12 to 18 months. I think this question sounds like it comes from the heart. So if the leader of an organisation responds in the wrong way to a crisis, how can you build influence to change response from senior management level? When there has not been a proper crisis team set up or is that not possible mid-crisis due to the urgency so basically how can others help in a crisis if the leader is failing uh yeah i mean the 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 reality to that one is that um most of the after preparedness work does need to be done um in uh, in advance the only thing i would say um about that it is incumbent on the leader him or herself to go out and seek counsel uh from others and and often um, if crisis leaders are, are struggling, sometimes there can be a tendency to shoulder the entirety of the situation on their own shoulders and perhaps not open their mind um, to the vast array of different views um, that might be out there. Selecting who you ask to give those views, of course, uh, clearly becomes um, absolutely um, vital. But but the, the, the effective crisis leader, I think, spends 80% of their time listening and 20% of their time speaking and directing. Okay, thanks. Um, do you recommend complete transparency during a crisis? or base it on a need to know basis? Um, communications in some crises, particularly public health emergencies, is an incredibly important discipline because of course the welfare of those that are hearing the message um, is um, at stake um, as well. So there is no single answer um, to that, uh, I, I'm afraid. Uh, that doesn't mean organizations should hide things. Um, the start point for any message in any narrative is what is the truth, um, but at times, um, that desire to tell the truth has to be treated with huge responsibility um, and care. So um, I'm afraid I'm not, I'm not going to um, be able to give that one a, a yes or no answer. It really does depend on the situation. And, and again, back to your object is what are we trying to achieve here um, for the good, not just of our organisation, but also for the stakeholders work as well who depend upon it. Um. So I'd just like to say a thank you to Tim for today's presentation and to the CIM Southwest for organising the event. Uh, we do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express, Doing Good Things Driven by Data, is on Wednesday, the 30th of June at 1 pm, hosted by CIM Wales. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, thank you once again, Tim, for a really good presentation. And thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.